actually have no idea how conscious experience arises from this blob of matter that weighs three pounds. It's, it's really uh, a still very much a mystery. trick-or-treating today we have elevators right I know that you didn't have a good time in one of them but your mom and dad weren't in there with you right but I'm gonna be there with you today now I think that there's three floors that we need to go to so I would like you to choose one just one time that you can either go up or down one floor and I'll be with you the whole time I know, honey, I know. But you know what? There's going to be some day that you go into a huge building a long time from now, and you won't want to take all those stairs all the time. Okay? All the time. It'll take forever if you're up in a tall building. And remember when that happened to you? Were you by yourself in the elevator, or were you with somebody? So do you think you'll get stuck in there if you have your teachers and friends with you? No, nope, you'll be safe. How about you and I will take the stairs to the second floor, and then we'll take the elevator one time to number... Yep, yeah. and then... But then listen, take a deep breath. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay, honey. It's gonna be okay. Let's have a little bit of water. We're just gonna take the elevator one time, honey. And then I promise the rest of the day we're gonna take the stairs. So that means it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay, honey. I don't want to go trick-or-treating. You don't want to go trick-or-treating? Really? What would you, you want to sit in the comment room while all your friends go trick-or-treating? That won't be fun, honey. How about 
you and I can do an elevator a different day. Because today's way too important. I don't want you to miss the trick or treating. Do you need a hug? Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Oh. We're going to do the elevator a different day, okay? Not today. You can drink your water, okay? Okay. I'm going to go talk to the other teachers about it, okay? Will you finish your water? Okay. Is everything up there going to be scary? No, nothing is going to be scary. Everybody's going to be there to be happy with you, okay? It's the brain changing the brain. We know that the brain changes all through our life, but we just don't know how that happens. When you're in the military, you're asked to do things that in everyday life are considered wrong. The person I had to be to do my job was a horrible person, in my eyes. It was a horrible person, and I was good at it. Okay, we'll clean this up, and then we'll open that one. Lawrence, why don't you come help clean up, too? Come on, Amelia, put this in there. Put that in. in there. Clean up. Help clean up. Help clean up. Before I joined the Army, it was very rare that I would get to the point where I am so angry at somebody that I'm balling up my fists and I'm preparing to hit them. Um, it happens a lot now. And, you know, that's not a feeling I want to have around them. Suicides among the veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan are reaching epidemic proportions. Some 1,000 suicide attempts are happening among veterans every month. But how can we say we're taking care of our troops when we have an increasing number of soldiers taking their own lives? The soldiers seem to be suffering classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, explosions of anger, suicidal and homicidal ideation, flashbacks, nightmares and insomnia. The army I wrote the diary um, while I was deployed overseas, while I was deployed in Iraq. And um, I kept it and used it kind of as a way that, that uh, you would use a friend or someone to talk to. November 9th is blank because it was, at the time, it was not a day that I wanted to write down and remember. And um, the 9th of November, I went out with uh, my platoon into, into Baghdad. And um, we had stopped in the green zone where the parade grounds were for Saddam, and we were taking a, a quick platoon picture. As we passed by one of the, the other cops, and we heard an extremely large explosion, it was very different than the others. Um, it sounded a little higher pitched, like thunder clapping, instead of the deep roll that we're used to. I started to receive updates from our battalion. Um, one, of our, one of our sister units, one of the units in the area with us, uh, an MP unit that was in Humvees had been hit by a, an IED. And I can remember we pulled up behind them. And as I looked up further on the road, laying in, there in, in the road was, uh, I think it was the gunner. And, and he had, um, he had, he had quadruple amputation. He, he, was, um, he was not doing well. And we, 
we tried and started to work on him and I got my medic up there and did what we could to kind of stabilize him and got a stretcher out. And in the meantime, we had, we had called in a helicopter to get him out of there, got him loaded on the helicopter um, and uh, the helicopter took off. And, and probably that, it felt like that took forever. It probably took less than five minutes. Then the, the tough task of picking up the remains of the two people killed started. They were, their bodies were pretty mangled and torn up. And it got very difficult to uh, even identify what you were cleaning up. The scents, the smells, the images, the sounds, the Some of those pictures I'll never forget. sleep every night. Without the medication, I, I've gone nights without sleeping. I don't like what I did. Um, there are practices that are designed to promote beneficial qualities in the person. Compassion meditation is a kind of meditation that we've studied extensively. And there's a region of the brain that we call the insula. And it's an area of the brain that is literally used for interacting between the mind and the body. And this area of the brain is dramatically enhanced in its activation during compassion meditation and will enable practitioners who practice compassion meditation regularly to feel the emotion of others more easily. We have found that three months of meditation practice lead to changes on certain measures of attention that reflect a person's capacity to pick up on small changes in her or his environment. A lot of our daily lives are spent in social interaction, where we interact with other people. And the reality is that much of that information is not conscious. We're just not aware of it. Uh, and what we find after three months of meditation practice, people are able to notice much more subtle things in their environment, which would lead people to be better at picking up on others. Uh, research indicates that emotional intelligence is a far more important ingredient in life than is um, traditional cognitive intelligence. And so uh, our ability to pick up on the emotions of others, to understand our own emotions, to regulate our attention, those are qualities which really can make a big difference in terms of life success. Does anyone think this is a real brain? No. No. Uh, our real brain is not colored like this, is it? No. This is a model of a brain. The brain actually is probably the most complicated thing that exists in the whole universe. Scientists estimate that it has about 10 billion connections, which is one with um, many, many, many zeros following it. <laughs> we can feel all the different feelings that we feel because the brain is as complicated as it is. You mean like if you're feeling sad? Or are you feeling... How else might you feel? Frustrated. Frustrated. Oh. How Bad. else? Bad. Bad. Angry. Angry. Mm -hmm. There are different parts of the brain that become active when we have feelings of sadness 
and feelings of frustration and feelings of happiness. And we can change our brains for the better. And that's something that is possible for every single person. And one of the really cool things is that Laura is actually going to be teaching you some exercises which can actually help you to change your feelings. You can be happier and you can feel um, kinder toward all of your friends more easily. Your teachers invited me to come in here to teach you some things. <gasps> and guess how I feel on the inside about that? Happy. I feel happy and I also feel really excited. So what we're going to learn about is a brand new word maybe for some people. <gasps> it's called mindfulness. Can you say that? Mindfulness. Two important things happen with mindfulness. One is mindfulness means paying attention. And it looks like almost everyone is paying attention. The other thing about mindfulness is when you pay attention, what happens to your body? Does it get all busy? No. No, what happens to your body when you're paying attention? It gets slow. You can pay attention on the outside and you can pay attention on the inside. So the first thing we're gonna do today is pay attention on the inside. Is everybody ready? Have you ever done that before? No? So I brought something. Rice. You think it's rice. How does it feel in your body to be thinking about what's in there? Good. I'm gonna open the container and see what's inside. Are you ready? Yeah. Who knows what that is? Will? Um, a bell. We're gonna listen. And when the bell stops, when you can't hear it anymore, raise your hand. Ready? about how often doctors are prescribing Ritalin and other drugs to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's important to know there are other options. Someone who's diagnosed with ADHD doesn't have to spend the rest of their life every waking minute on medication. What do you know? Live from Atlanta, Georgia to San Antonio, Texas, it's Michael Feldman's What Do You Know from Wisconsin Public Radio and PRI Public Radio International. Richard Davidson is here, isn't he? Yep. Are you here? Come on, Richard. Just get We're not formal here. Richard Davidson, ladies and gentlemen, from the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin. For those of you who didn't think there were healthy minds at the University of Wisconsin, Richard is here to prove you wrong. <laughs> Was there such a field uh, as this before? Not really. Uh, you, we, we call it contemplative neuroscience. So you're thinking about neuroscience. Well, uh, it is the neuroscience of contemplative practice. So and contemplative practice has to do with taking intentional control of our own mind. Do we not ordinarily have control of our minds? Or I would say that ordinarily we actually have very little control of our own mind. We may think we have control, but um, we really don't. We can actually be happier people. We can suffer less if we take responsibility for our own mind. Alex. I'm 
are joined by Dr. Richard Davidson, Vilas Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry. Richie is a recipient of the American Psychological Association's Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award and was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. We are um, about to launch a very large uh, involved study with returning veterans who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Veterans who are suffering tremendously. Many of them have post-traumatic stress disorder. So thank you guys all for being part of this uh, study. It's uh, a real honor to have each of you. We are interested in the examination of methods that may be um, uh, non-pharmacological methods that uh, may be helpful in calming your autonomic nervous system, like your, um, your cardiovascular system and certain hormones. Uh, we are interested also in methods that may help calm the mind. Um, some of the same methods can do both. Uh, and uh, we're interested in using the best of scientific research to understand and to track how these interventions may actually be producing their effects. For the study, we've invited 20 participants, and we're dividing um, the participants into two groups. One is the active group, and one is the control group. And the active group is going to have the intervention. It's a breathing-based uh, practice, seven days in a row, about three hours a day. So it's an intensive program, and it allows us to take measures right before and right after. And if we see any changes in seven days, um, that would be pretty extraordinary. That's for measuring that. Okay, did we? We just saw it. Did you see that reaction? Yeah. About 50% of veterans who are doing a treatment for PTSD, a more standard treatment, um, respond, and 50% do not respond to the treatment at all. Um, so there's a real need to understand different ways and different interventions that might be helpful for people, and that's what we're trying to do here. You can remove the uh, earphones. Do you, are you good to go or do you need a break? We're also um, giving them open-ended questionnaires, for example, words or sentences that they need to complete. When they complete the words, do they complete them with more negative words or positive words? Do they complete the sentences with words that are more related to war or trauma? The silence was broken by the bomb. His heart raced with despair. He sprayed the whole area with pesticide. His, his friend, friend had a big hole in his, his chest. chest. The unfortunate man lost his leg. Anybody here felt uh, 
an overwhelming emotion in the last two or three months, anger, sadness, fear. Combat trauma and PTSD, <clears throat> in its simplest form, it's an experience that happened to somebody that was so traumatic that even though their body's in the present, their mind got, got somehow stuck there. How many people have had experiences like that? The same memory keeps coming back, the same experience gets lived over and over again. But we're gonna find ways that are gonna help us live more in the present moment. What's the first thing we do in life? Cry. We cry and then take a breath. What's the last thing we do in life? And then other people cry. <laughs> and between this and this is life and our breath. And how many of us have paid attention to our breath? Like right now, where's your breath? Do you breathe here? Do you breathe low? How do you breathe? As a kind of a ritual, wherever we teach, we're going to start the same way with this. But like everybody, stand up. I want you to walk around the room and greet everybody and wish them good luck in the course. Right. John, Andy, 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 In through the back of the throat, mouth still open. Now close the mouth and see if you can breathe through the back of the throat. Keep the eyes closed, put your palms facing up on your lap. Breathe normally. We're going to do some yoga stretching while we're practicing this breathing. We have been doing foster care and we um, got a call from the county to take a newborn baby that was five days old that needed an emergency placement. Um, so we met Will at day, when he was five days old and he was in the intensive care unit for about another two weeks after that and then we brought him home. Um, over the next two years, Will was placed in four other placements besides our home and he was in our home twice. We felt, I felt, that Will needed to be placed with a permanent family and we looked at kind of our life and where we're at, and it, as being older, um, we, we were um, at a point where we thought he would be better off long-term with the younger family. Um, 
I'm 58, going to be 59. Sarah's 54, going to be 55. And three years ago, you know, you can figure out the math, right? And the birth mom was fighting um, losing Will. And when this happened, she was sober enough, long enough to understand what was happening to Will. And she came to us, asked us to adopt Will. And she was willing to voluntarily give up her rights if Sarah and I would adopt him. The thing that really impacted me the most through this whole process is when uh, Will was in the, his last placement before we got him back. Uh, we had a chance to go see Will, and Will was um, 20 months old, and we're getting ready to leave. And Will goes and gets his coat and wants to come with us and was upset that he couldn't come with us after he hadn't really seen us for six, six, eight, six, weeks, six, yeah. six eight weeks. And the impact that had on me was just enormous. You look at how traumatic the experience a little kid would have before 20 months old to have four different or five different placements with different families. And when we got Will back and he struggled, uh, you know, he lives out loud. Uh, he has no filter. He's very spontaneous. Um, and we went and met with a number of different doctors to help us specialists. help mm -hmm. specialists to help us help him. And the thing that they talked about early on was they diagnosed him as ADHD. And they wanted to medicate him at three years old. And that's crazy to us to give kids um, these powerful drugs to help calm their behavior. Um, and we felt that w there are, are other ways and better ways to deal with that. So Will, I heard that when you go by elevators, they get you really, really angry or really upset. Is that true? How does it feel on the inside when that's happening? Scared. It feels scared. And where on the inside does it happen? Right here. It happens in here? This is for you in the class. How did you put that in there? You know what? What? In a, um, I think next week everyone's going to make one of these. But I wanted to check it out with you first. Shake it up really hard, like as if you were really mad or really angry. And watch it settle. Watch those sparkles go down. Watch it very closely. This jar right now is like your mind when you're angry and upset. It's bouncing all over the place. And then we see the angry thoughts settling down, right? I'm just watching. Are you watching? It's going down in here. It is. Can you see it? What do you think about that mind jar? Do you think that we should leave it at school so that if you're feeling angry or upset, that you could maybe shake it? Mine. If the Reuben is good, I'm gonna get the Reuben. Reuben. Yeah. It's basically um, a corned beef sandwich. Oh. They tried to hold a hand and like, you know, she's not gonna get something. No, I just don't like people behind me. You wanna go get up? Actually, no, it's just, yeah. good. Yeah. Can you do that? I'm just gonna, I'll just. No, move. no, let's no, do that. I, I'll just move. This is okay. Ah. 
No, 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 you can have a spoon. She always gets to something, you I know, know. sharpest. Mm. Spoon! She's like, that's boring. Spoon! Out of those 24, 10 of them have had some kind of PTSD symptoms. So those who have really like more severe symptoms are self-medicating and they are doing drugs. They're doing marijuana daily. But what, what about suicidality? Of those 23, how many reported um, a specific thought about suicide? Not death, but suicide. Maybe four or five. Okay, well we really, we should review each of their yeah. cases now. Yeah. This is past. Um, he doesn't have. Yeah, totally. This is this one of six. shaded in this red color is the amygdala and then this is the hippocampus just behind it it's been found in individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder that the literal size of the hippocampus tends to be smaller compared to a normal brain the hippocampus is really important for enabling people to modulate their emotions in a way that's appropriate to the situation they're in the amygdala is the area of the brain that's critical for detecting the cues of threat in the first place, and then once the cue is detected, another part of the amygdala actually unleashes this cascade of responding that includes three major components. One is a behavioral component, which may be associated with freezing or with running away, with fleeing. It could include an autonomic component, that's the second component, which would involve changes, for example, in heart rate and in blood pressure to prepare the organism to act. And the third component is changes in hormones. Uh, and the key hormone here is cortisol, which is a stress hormone. In the study that we're currently doing with the veterans, the training will only last uh, one week. We do not yet know if training that's this short can actually produce changes in the function and the structure of the brain. Who has the young kids? Somebody has a young kid. <clears throat> yeah, too young there. You wouldn't want to take your five-year-old to see the exorcist, right? Because? Right? Oh, because they it scared the crap out of them. Right. Because they couldn't discern the difference between reality and what was coming up on the screen, right? right? They don't have that capacity. For a lot of us in this room, the same thing is happening. Something's coming up on the screen, and there's a part of the body-mind complex that can't discern because it's so overwhelming. Everybody hold up their thumb. Luis, do you have a thumb, or are you your thumb? I have a thumb. You have a thumb. There's a difference between you and your thumb, right? Okay, so I'm going to ask you the same question. You have some things in your past that you've had to struggle to come to grips with. Is that right? In that moment when they come up, when they're the most intense, do you have those thoughts or are you those thoughts or those experiences in that moment? I feel like I have those thoughts, like I'm swearing. So but, they, but they can overwhelm you, right? Yeah. So in that moment, you are them or they are you. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. Through the breath and through the meditation, we're going to discern again between the experience or the process of experience 
and the, the object of experience, the experience itself, and delink them so that it, it loses some of its power to come and completely overwhelm you in the moment. First thing you want to do is to see, plug the right nostril. We're not using the victory breath, just the regular breath. In and out with the left nostril. And plug the left in and out with the right. Memory reconsolidation is a process by which a memory is brought up and the relationship that you have to that memory can be changed. And we know that this can happen. And so we think one of our hypotheses is that while their body goes into deep state of rest through the breathing, that a reconsolidation process can happen. back on things, I, that's what I remember, is the looks and people's faces. I, I use people's families against them, you know? Um, when, you know, you wait for any signs of weakness to come up, you exploit that. Um, you know, somebody talks about, you know, pleads, Please let me go. You know, my, my mother's sick. She doesn't have anybody else to take care of her. You turn that around on them. You start giving them um, hypotheticals, worst case scenarios. Uh, the things that they're worrying about, you know, that any, anybody would worry about, you verbalize them. You make it real for them. What's gonna happen to your wife? What's gonna happen to your son? What's gonna happen to your daughter? Who's gonna take care of them? You know, you're the only one that can feed them, right? Can, your wife can't go out and work. Your son's too young to go out and work. How are they gonna get food? You know, it's like, do you have a neighbor that'll take care of them? Who's your neighbor? What's his name? Is he a nice guy? Do you think you're, he'll take care of your wife? What will happen a few years down the line? What do you think people will think if I just let you go tomorrow? If you really want to go home, I can drop you off in front of your house from a Humvee, you know? I mean, in a lot of cases, that's a death sentence. Am I going to do it? No, never. Does he know that? Probably not. I don't know how many times I, I've made somebody soil themselves. And, you know, and afterwards I'm, you know, I'm bragging about it and laughing about it, you know? Maybe if I would have shared things, if I would have approached it differently um, and been more open to discussing some of these things, the direction that my wife and I took may have changed. But I don't know. Where is she now? She's here in Wisconsin. But we've started the separation process. when you got Steve back from the war and he'd experienced all these things that that you were not part of. How did that affect you? How, did he talk about it or? Uh, what he had been through during mm -hmm. their deployment? Mm -hmm. No. And I decided not to ask him until he's ready to talk. It's, it's really bad that, you know, you never know what happened to the you know person 
the closest person to you next to you um especially with your with little kids you're so you know i was so stressed out and i really need his help but he's not ready for that he's more like just really having a problem with his dealing his emotion i, I think i was less emotionally stable i i would swing yeah yeah longer, yeah yeah did it scare you oh yeah it did it's it's it was really bad It was a time where, you know, I was kind of... I was alone with myself, I, you know, I was just kind of shoving everything out. And I was coming home, I should be happy to be with my wife and kids, but really all I, I just wanted to be alone. I was mad, I was angry, I was quick-tempered. There were times where I didn't, I, that I thought Alex was ignoring me or not paying attention to me and, you know, I'd, I'd reach out and grab hold of her arms and, and just kind of you know, hold her there so that she would look at me and afterwards you should show me that and just by grabbing a hold of her that I had bruised her on the arms. Until we started the process of divorce and separation, I was, I would have said I was fine. If you would have asked her, she would have told you that I was different when I returned and I never returned to the same person. So if he's just laying down, doing his own thing, do you think that it's a kind thing to do to put sand in his mouth? No. no. And then you laughed about it. It wasn't. I guess Will's not ready. And say, but, but I am ready. What if we go inside and you can use your snow globe to calm down? Something? No! And that! <laughs> and that! <laughs> well, what do you want to use to help you? Nothing! I want to play. I'm gonna come back in five minutes, okay? Every emotion has a corresponding rhythm of the breath that goes with it. Remember we talked about the guy that got angry and you could feel him getting angry, you could watch him getting angry through the breath. And when we were young, these, these rhythms, we were born with them, they were natural to us. This breath that we're gonna learn today is designed to instill those natural rhythms back in us. There may be some changes in the mind or body during the process of breathing, and they could be a little diverting. But the key to success in this breathing is whatever is happening inside to continue to throw it into the breath. How many people are willing to go through the process even if it's a little challenging? Let us take a transition breath in. Breathe in and let it go. And with victory breath, breathe in. Two, three, four, hold. Two, three, four, breathe out. Two, three, four, breathe in. Hold. 
breathe out. Hold. Breathe in. So, what was it like? Anybody speak? Mitch? I kept up with the breathing and that, okay? But, uh, towards the end of it, like my arms and my hands started to cramp up. Um, and as soon as I laid down, I just got hit by a, a ton of guilt, actually. I kind of flashed back to two people that I felt responsible for that had gotten killed. I kept seeing faces go by, uh, and my eyes, and, and it's... Faces from your past. Yeah. And the kind of, like, the thoughts of those people are still kind of with me. I don't know if people heard it, but I laughed. <laughs> I was trying to cover up a cry, because I was thinking about a translator that I made good friends with when I was over there. And when we left, they, uh, they, you know, sent this head to his family and stuff like that. Oh, I didn't really like it at all, actually. Um, I like the, I like the fast breathing, kind of opposite of you guys, because it like, gave me something to do, but it, uh, the whole sitting around thing, I'm kind of progressively liking it less and less, because it's just, it's like, I'm, I'm used to being really busy all the time, so I can't like think about stuff, and now it's making me just like think about stuff that I don't really like doing. The breathing allows the trauma to be released. So it's not like you're experiencing these feelings, which aren't so easy to experience for no reason. I will be calling you this afternoon and just checking in and saying hello. Is that okay with everybody? Brian, Brian, <clears throat> it's okay. So will you make sure you answer or call me back?
loved his kissing hand. Now he knew his mother's love would go with him wherever he went, even to school. that there's an empty seat over there and uh, that's because Ryan isn't with us today and he called last night and he said I'm just not sure there's stuff coming up in me I'm just not sure I'm ready to deal with it yet and we told him a lot of things about uh, and maybe some of you are experiencing some stuff inside that you know you weren't sure that you were going to be dealing with at this point in your life he's welcome here um, we hope he finds a way to complete his mission but we didn't want you to wonder why he's not here I don't know, I kind of thought I was ready to talk about some stuff in my past and and um, the like the deep breathing and the yoga and all that kind of stuff just uh, made it a little more difficult than I kind of anticipated. I'm used to having my mind occupied all the time and with either school or working out, training, work, whatever, you know, I'm, always, I'm used to always being busy. I think I'm uh, doing a lot better than some of the people that I know that I got back and like my my working out, my going to an extreme level of fitness is basically the equivalent to them going out and drinking or doing drugs. It's just their way. That's what their way of dealing with it. I chose this, and they chose that. And it's that yeah, everybody has their own method of doing it. But I, per, you know, personally, I think this is better. My colleagues were, for the most part, uh, extremely skeptical. And they made it very clear that if I wanted a successful career in science, this was not a good way for me to begin it. So I stopped doing meditation research. There are very few people that actually knew I was a meditator. I was a closet meditator. Uh, and of course, all that changed in 1992 when I met the Dalai Lama. And he said to me, we've been using tools of modern neuroscience to study qualities like fear and anxiety and depression. Why can't we use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? Okay, One, two. What two? Plants and bulbs need to grow. Sun and water. Sun is one thing. Water is another thing. Soil. Love. Oh! <laughs> Do you know why? Because, it, because if you don't love it, it won't grow. That's right. If you don't care for things, will they grow? No. First, put in the bulbs. Then put dirt on top of them. Can everybody use these cups at the same time? There are only two. Wait. I need dirt. Oh, that was mine. She gave it to me. What happened, buddy? What happened? What happened, honey? both to talk with me for a second. <laughs> Does it feel tight in here? Yeah, put your hand, show me with your hand how it feels inside. Where does it hurt? Where does it feel tight? Right there? And in your throat. Okay, watch me. Put your hand on your belly and take in a breath with me. You ready? Blow it out. And breathe in. And breathe out. Now, this is what I, I would like you to do. How does it feel in there now? Does it still feel tight? As tight or less tight? 
Less, good. So here's my question. I would like to a have you ask him, say, say, tell me why you're sad. Tell me why you're sad. Hey, Lula. You said that for Oh, so what did he say? He snatched it from him. Oh, and how does he look right now? Sad. Very, very sad. But I really oh, wait, him. But, but wait a sec, but wait a sec. So <coughs> now I want you to tell him how you're feeling. Can you listen to him when he talks? All right. Go ahead, tell him how you're feeling when you see him so sad. Sad? You feel sad too? Mm. Show me where in your body you feel sad. Right here. Right here you feel sad in your body. It doesn't feel so good, does it? So what might you do to Halen to help him feel a little bit better? Sorry. You can say you're sorry. What else can you do to help him feel a little bit better? Oh, that would be nice. How, does, how do you feel on the inside? Good. Do you feel good or do you still feel tight and sad? Good. Good. True confessions, how many people were able to do their homework? Good. And how many people didn't find time? I'm wondering, have you guys practiced with belly buddies in a while? Spread out, you can come off your mat and spread out because I want to practice. Continual practice is something very, very important, and it's kind of like physical exercise. Uh, you don't go to a spa for 10 days and exercise and think that the benefits will last for the remainder of your life if you don't continue to practice. And um, meditation is very similar. Feel that rock going up and down. Breathing in. The brain of an accomplished meditator who is very happy uh, has a number of important characteristics which are different from the brain of an untrained person. One is that the area in the front part of the brain, which is uh, what we call the prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain is very important for the regulation of emotion and the regulation of attention. And one of the things that we find is that in long-term meditation practitioners, there is increased activation in this area of the brain. They become more pronounced during meditation, but they're also more pronounced just in the ordinary baseline state. Meditation, in addition to affecting the mind and the brain, it also affects our body. One of the things that we've studied is the immune system. And one of the ways we've studied it is by looking at a person's response to a flu vaccine. And one remarkable finding indicates that people who are taught meditation and meditating for the first time and go through two months of meditation actually show an enhanced response to the flu vaccine compared to untrained controls. And we just don't know how that actually comes about. Is it literally growing new neurons in specific uh, areas that contribute to this? Is it the strengthening of new connections? Is it pruning connections that may have been causing a lot of noise and disruption? And it's kind of like a sculptor who takes a block of marble and creates something beautiful by removing components, not adding anything. We don't know what the mechanism is. It could be any one of those mechanisms, or it could be all of them. 
if there was one thing or two things about myself at this point in my life that I'd like to recover or get in touch with again, what would they be? It's kind of, when I was a little kid, people used to always comment about how I smiled all the time. And, you know, I don't, I don't do that anymore. When I, when I look at my kids, they, they have that, that innocence, that naivete, that, like, I've, I've grown cynical and closed off, you know? I thought about it a lot. Um, then the, the realization kind of set in that you know, maybe I haven't, um, I haven't really lived since I've been back. I've been just kind of here. Jason. It's, I guess it would be kind of innocence, just being able to let go. Right. Just be in the moment. There is a place inside you that that reality still exists. The question is, can we, can we find our way back there? Sleep safe, little bear, curled up with your brother and your mother in the cave. Sleep safe. Sleep safe, little penguin, under daddy's feathers. All warm in your ice cold world. <coughs> Sleep safe. is kind of a little far away, isn't it? Okay, we're getting close to the elevator. How does it feel in your body? Oh, good. It does? Okay, let's go over. All right, let's see what happens when the doors open. Do you want to stand in here and see how it feels in your belly? How does it feel in your belly? Good. It does? Are you sure? Do you want the doors to close or not? <laughs> so, Will, I'm wondering, maybe another day, could we take that mind jar with us and take a ride on the elevator? Another day or today? Um, another day. begin our going home program with you dry breath eyes closed normal breath in and out elbows to the sky palms on the shoulder blades biceps by the ears and relax.
came to the realization that for the last three years, I have not really lived. Instead, I have lived for my wife and may have contributed significantly to our problems. It has changed my life in ways I never thought possible. I feel happy, like a kid again. Coming in to the course, um, I wasn't feeling really good about myself and the things I had done. It actually happened last night. For the first time, I could look at stuff and, you know, not really feel anything about it and just, just look at it and just know that it happened. There's so many little things. I mean, just the fact that, you know, I've been able to sleep on my own uh, without, without having to take Ambien for, you know, almost a whole week is, is amazing. You know, live, guys. Just live. Give yourself permission to smile again. The poem is written by a guy named Derek Walcott. It's called Love After Love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome. And say, sit here, eat, You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who's loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. Can I hold your looks like the yeah. can I hold your hand and the other thing? Oh of course you can. Well, I'm a little bit scared. Okay. I'm gonna see. Okay, friends, we're gonna let Will. And remember, what does the snow globe do for you? Make me cool. Yeah. Oh, we're sunny. See you. Okay. Oh, we're sunny. Oh, okay. Are you ready? Hey. Now remember, when huh? you watch up there, huh? it's going to tell you which floors. And if you feel worried, what can you do with the snow globe? Shake it. Shake it up. Yep. Why? Okay, now watch this. How does your mind and your body feel right now? Calm. Is this fun, you guys? Yeah. Look, does it match the six and the six? Want to look out the window real quick? Yeah. Okay. It's actually a good thing to do to pick this up occasionally and to remind ourselves that this is the most complicated organ in the universe. We've only taken the first very, very small baby step. Uh, we're, we're just beginning this journey.
Thank you.